What we're going to do in this mini tutorial is look at the topography of the cranial nerves as they emerge from the brain. And what I mean by that is we're going to look at the places where they emerge and their relationships to one another. And the way that we're going to approach this is by looking at a diagram taken from clinically oriented anatomy, but at the same time we're going to draw our own diagram which should hopefully make this more memorable for you. Now the first thing that we need to do is to provide you with the correct orientation for the image which you can see on the left hand side of the screen. So we'll do that by drawing a quick cartoon of the whole central nervous system. So here is the brain with the brain stem, spinal cord and the cerebellum around the back and of course this is a view from the left hand side looking at the left hand side of the CNS and the view that we have got on the left is as if you were looking at the underneath of the brain at the underside of the brain so it is a ventral view right so it's a ventral view that we've got here looking at the underside of the brain so looking at the image on the left, to remind you, um, here is the cut end of the spinal cord down at the bottom. The spinal cord, of course, is in direct continuity with the medulla, which is this region here. So here is the medulla, the most caudal part of the brainstem. Immediately rostral to the medulla, we have the pons. So this region here is the pons and immediately rostral to the pons we have the midbrain um, which is actually fairly buried so it's hard to see most of the midbrain in this view but the line I'm drawing is the point at which the midbrain sits additionally of course we have the typical folded appearance of the cerebellum and we can also see the medial aspects of the temporal lobes of the brain as well as the inferior aspects of the frontal lobes of the brain. So hopefully you're comfortable with the orientation of the image we're going to look at. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw a kind of schematic outline of the image on the left <coughs> to try to make this more memorable. So I'm going to be drawing um, the spinal cord, the medulla, the pons and the midbrain. Um, and equally here, spinal cord, medulla, pons and midbrain. Here is the cerebellum. And here are the temporal lobes of the brain so you know this is cartoonish um, but we're trying to maintain the anatomical relationships here are the frontal lobes of the brain okay so hopefully the correlation between the two images is clear enough now, the first set of cranial nerves that I want to highlight for you um, is the olfactory nerve. Um, and I'm just going to highlight on the left-hand image just one side so that you can compare the highlighted with the unhighlighted portion. So here we can see all of these individual olfactory nerves emerging from the olfactory bulb which is connected to the rest of the brain via the olfactory tract there, like that. So let's draw that onto our cartoon on the right-hand side. So here are our olfactory tracts with the olfactory bulbs on the end. And you'll note that they're sitting on the inferior surface of the frontal lobes. And here these dots represent all those many, many individual olfactory nerves which are passing through the holes in the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. 
Now the second cranial nerve to highlight is of course the optic nerves and here is one optic nerve here so we can see that one optic nerve we can also see crosses over at this point and also there is a continuation of the visual system in the optic tracts going back into the brain here so on our cartoon we'll now draw the optic nerves and it's, it's, it's quite an easy there's quite an easy way to draw these and um, two lines like this and two lines like that so we can see <coughs> our optic chiasm where the axons of the optic nerves cross over and the two individual optic nerves on the left and right hand sides now this is quite a good point at which to emphasize to you that cranial nerves 1 and 2 are atypical of the cranial nerves they are not typical at all and the reason for this is that they are actually direct continuations of the brain itself the first two cranial nerves are direct continuations of the brain substance whereas the more caudal 10 cranial nerves are much more closely related to the spinal nerves so cranial nerves 1 and 2 are elements of the central nervous system whereas cranial nerves 3 through 12 are elements of the peripheral nervous system and that does have important clinical consequences for example when we're thinking about their ability to regenerate so the next nerve that we need to highlight is of course the third nerve the ocular motor nerve and that is here so the ocular motor nerve emerges from the midbrain okay so there we can see the two ocular motor nerves emerging from the ventral aspect of the midbrain that is to contrast the ocular motor nerve with the trochlear nerve seen here which actually emerges from the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. So what the trochlear nerves do is they come out round the back of the midbrain and then they hook around. Okay, so those are the trochlear nerves hooking around from the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. And the trochlear nerve is the only cranial nerve which is known to do this. The next cranial nerve is of course the fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and you can see it in the image on the left um, in purple. So this is the large trigeminal nerve. And in purple we have the sensory root, the sensory part of the trigeminal nerve, but this tiny bit in yellow here is the motor part of the trigeminal nerve. Now let's draw those on to the other diagram. So here is the three branches of the trigeminal nerve, uh, made bigger than they are in real life, just for clarity. All right. Additionally, my image on the right is much simplified because I have combined both the motor and sensory roots but you need to be aware that they are actually separate when you look at them in the real brain. The sixth cranial nerve emerges on the ventral aspect of the brain stem at this point, right at the junction between the, the medulla and the pons. So this is the junction between the medulla and the pons from which the sixth cranial nerve emerges. So here is the sixth cranial nerve emerging from the junction between the medulla and the pons and it's quite interesting the abducens nerve in that it's got an extremely long intracranial course um, and this puts it at risk of damage by compression from say tumors um, because because of that long intracranial course it's more likely to be compressed 
So now, in order to appreciate the cranial nerves emerging from the medulla, I think what we should do is zoom in. Um, so we're going to zoom in and look at the details of the medullary region here. And what you can see, um, of course, is to remind you, here is the sixth cranial nerve, the abducens nerve. Here is the boundary, the junction between the pons and the medulla. Um, and what you can see is that we've got now a whole load of nerves forming quite a complex plexus. <clears throat> now, we're on the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve. So, so let's highlight that. Um, so what we want to do is highlight the facial nerve. Now, similar to the trigeminal nerve, the facial nerve has itself two components. Um, in yellow here, in yellow here, we have the, the, the main root of the facial nerve, if you like. And this is the part of the facial nerve which contains the motor axons that supply the muscles of facial expression. Now the adjacent root in green here is known as nervous intermedius and this is the part of the facial nerve which contains um, sensory and autonomic components. So the facial nerve is in effect made from two separate components. So if we then zoom back out and go to our original arrangement and uh, we can add on the facial nerve um, and the facial nerve is emerging from this boundary between the medulla and the pons but more laterally compared to the abducens nerve now to zoom in once more and we can consider the 8th cranial nerve, which is here. And once again, you can see it's in two separate components. And we would be able to predict the names of those two components based upon the name of the nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve. So we have a vestibular component, which is carrying information concerning uh, balance and posture. And we have a cochlear component, which is carrying auditory information. So we have two components forming one nerve. Um, if, if you want an everyday analogy to this kind of arrangement, imagine um, a headphones cable, the cable on your headphones, and how sometimes the two thin cables are kind of welded together, but you can peel them apart. If, if ever you fiddle with them, you can peel them apart. That's a bit like how these nerves are arranged. So now let's add the vestibulocochlear nerve to our cartoon diagram and the vestibular cochlear nerve of course is coming out in the same region as the facial nerve. <clears throat> the final nerve that we need to consider in this area is the glossopharyngeal nerve and this is where we're getting into this rather complex and daunting looking plexus and the glossopharyngeal nerve is in fact this one here. So that's the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth cranial nerve, emerging from the rostral medulla. Um, and we can add that then on to our main diagram. So then we've got the glossopharyngeal nerve here. Now the vagus can be seen as being composed of a number of roots from quite a large plexus emerging from the lateral medulla. So all of these roots here are contributing to the formation of the vagus nerve itself. And that's what I mean when I say things start to get quite complex um, down towards the medulla um, because a lot of these nerves do merge together um, and coalesce, making interpretation of lesions sometimes rather difficult. 
Um, but there was the vagus nerve, um, which was emerging um, as a number of rootlets from, from the medulla, which coalesced together to form the vagus nerve itself at that point. So there's the vagus, number 10. And what we can also see, interestingly, is the relationship between the vagus nerve and the accessory nerve. Now, if you look here, this here, this root here, rising up from the spinal cord, is the spinal accessory nerve. So these are actually a set of rootlets emerging from the lateral aspect of the cervical spinal cord, coming together to form the spinal part of the accessory nerve. And actually what happens is that the accessory nerve joins up with the vagus nerve. Um, some interesting things happen in the jugular foramen, which you might like to do some reading about. But at the end of the day, this portion of the accessory nerve goes down and supplies trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. So there is the spinal part of the accessory nerve rising up through the foramen magnum and joining forces with the vagus. So we can add that to our diagram here on the right. So here is the spinal accessory coming up through foramen magnum and joining up with the vagus. And that only leaves us with one cranial nerve left, that being the hypoglossal nerve. And the hypoglossal nerve is once again made up of a number of smaller rootlets, namely these small rootlets here, which, much like in the vagus, join together to form the hypoglossal nerve itself. The thing to note about the 12th cranial nerve is that actually it does not emerge cordially compared to 10 and 11, it actually emerges ventrally. So let's just add the hypoglossal nerve on and our job for the time being should be complete. So yes, here are the rootlets of the hypoglossal nerve there coming together to form that 12th cranial nerve. So now let's um, recap. So the first cranial nerve we said was here, the olfactory nerve. The second cranial nerve, the optic nerve, can be seen there with its crossover called the optic chiasm. The third cranial nerve can be seen here. And the fourth cranial nerve the trochlea is a thin nerve which emerges from the dorsal aspect of the brainstem and hooks around. So there's the trochlear nerve, the fourth nerve. The trigeminal nerve, the fifth nerve, is a very big nerve with a very large sensory root and a smaller motor root, but it ultimately splits into three major branches. The sixth cranial nerve, the abducens nerve, emerges ventrally at the junction between the pons and the medulla. The seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, emerges laterally from the junction between the pons and the medulla and has two components um, which give it its two major functions. The eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve, emerges very close to the facial nerve and also has two components, a vestibular and a cochlear part. The ninth cranial nerve um, emerges from the rostral medulla and actually is very difficult to delineate from those multiple rootlets of the adjacent vagus nerve. So there's the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth nerve. We said that the vagus, number 10, 
is made up of multiple small rootlets emerging from the lateral part of the rostral medulla and the eleventh cranial nerve the accessory is a very unusual nerve in that it has a large component which rises up from a number of roots in the cervical spinal cord. Finally the twelfth cranial nerve the hypoglossal nerve is made up of many many small rootlets in the ventral medulla which coalesce to form one single nerve. So I hope that this has been helpful to you um, you may find that you'll need to watch this a few times in order to get the most from it and probably best to watch it in conjunction with the other videos and having a textbook diagram open in front of you as well. Okay thank you